Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is taking us to some deeper waters of kingdom culture. And let me say this to every one of us. When it comes to kingdom culture, nobody is immune. Everyone, teacher alike, is a message for all of us how to live. Religion did not prepare us for kingdom culture because religion is based on parking your car, so to say, at a particular car park, which is a denomination. And how do denominations come about? A man receives a revelation, one part of the Lord or of his kingdom, and that part he, release, he receives, he expounds it mightily. And then people come to him and they park there in the car park. Other parts of the truth, they don't know because it wasn't revealed to their founder. So the Lord wants us to get out of our various denominational car parks and just come to him so that he can break out, break down his word and we can receive guidance on how he wants to leave us to live on this side of eternity in preparation as a dress rehearsal for how we're going to live for all the time in future when he returns for the thousand year reign and for all eternity. And so, in the previous lesson, lesson 22, we share with you how Yeshua established the reality that he did not come to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill the law. He didn't come to nullify what Moses said. He came to fulfill them because we couldn't fulfill them with the natural nature of Adam we have. We need him, his grace, when we uh, become his own by the new birth experience, where he gives us power to become the sons of Elohim. When we embrace Yahweh's salvation in him, then it is possible for us to live out the provisions of the world. So what was the intention of the law that was given to Moses and Moses gave it to them, and over time, Israel had modified the law, and they left the intention and focused on the observance of certain external regulations and ceremonial cleansings and all that. And so, brothers and sisters, that sets the stage. So, I urge you to go and study Lesson 22 so that you can be prepared better for Lesson 23, because here in Lesson 23, the Lord is talking about what can happen when the power of His grace comes in. He says, hey, to them who receive Him, He gave power to become the children of Elohim. So, for that reason, we now go on to Lesson 23, where kingdom culture deals with heart obedience rather than outward observance, and the particular case of murder and anger and offense and sacrifices are brought into focus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask for your grace to receive your word and let your word come in its purity. Let it do a work in us, dislodging anything that is not of you. Let your word purge, cleanse, and purify us. And let your word empower us to be able to live it out. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. And so, in Matthew chapter 5, we come to, I thought we'd have an easy walkover, just take a few verses, a few lines for each one, and then we'll be through with it this morning, after praying, and when I went in to receive what the Lord wanted to say, it turned out that Lord said, no, that's not going to be the approach, because it's going to be the heart of what will turn things around. So if you are a member of International Ministers Fellowship, if you are part of the Global School of Ministry, you are part of the master class, you are in any way involved in the, uh, you know, the three restoration, reformation, and revival movement worldwide, I urge you to, let's all pay attention to these things. The Lord wants to cleanse our kingdom communities from the micro level, family, to the local assembly, to the network level. The Lord wants to show us certain things that will help us and he's dealing with issues that have become major major drawback for many people across the world so please let's listen very carefully 
in the book of Matthew 5, 21, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be danger of judgment. So here, the law of Moses forbade murder because life is in the blood. Whoever spills the blood of another is playing God who alone gives and reserves the right to take life any time. So, if you take life of somebody, you are in danger of judgment because the great judge is going to ask you, did I ask you to take for me? Now, Yeshua now comes to a very important principle. I want us all, please, let's pay attention. In verse 22, But I, you see, he said to you of old, Moses said to you, But I, the prince of life, I, the king of kings, say unto you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Wow, this is deep, brothers and sisters. So in kingdom culture, Yeshua wants to deal with the root of murder. Where is the root of murder? It's not the act, which is the outward thing. The root lies in offense against another. The root lies in anger against another. The root lies in having a negative view of another that can then be stoked up by the enemy. So let's now look at the points here on that point two, number 12. 12.1. When Elohim sees the slightest trace of anger, anger in the heart of his own, especially the type that is easily activated by the slightest of reasons, the individual is in danger of judgment. This is talking to all of us. Me, number one, you, every one of us. The Lord is saying, once he sees the trace, listen, in the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 18, the Lord says, Woe to the world because of offenses. Offenses will surely come. There will be things that you don't like because of your background, where you were born, because of your training, because of your education, because of your preference. There are things you're going to meet that you don't normally like. But the Lord wants us to know there is no reason on earth for us to retain offense. If we retain, we endanger our spiritual life. And so the Lord is saying, you know what? There are some remedies for this situation, for dealing with anger, which is the root cause of many broken relationships, root cause of many murder, acts of murder and manslaughter worldwide, acts of various things that men cannot see. So what does he say we should do? One, our focus should shift from the person or the things that irritate us to our own heart, our own soul, our mind, our will, our emotion. And towards Elohim, who sees and knows how sinful that inner state of turmoil is because he does not represent him and stays our witness to the world. So the Lord is saying, if you keep looking at the person, looking at the circumstance and situation, you will never let go. You will find reason to retain that anger. But if I look inward and see and say, look, what is it that is in me? And then look up to the Lord and see his glory. And his glory will show me how negative it is that I'm retaining an offense. Then there's a chance for me. Two, we should be honest to ourselves to acknowledge that it is sin that has entered and quickly repent and seek deliverance of sin. That thing, that, that offense that is inside is sin that has entered. If we know that, we're going to deal with it. If we don't know that, we will fondle it, we'll fondle with it, we'll cuddle it, and we'll give it life. We'll give oxygen to it. Three, anger should not be permitted to linger all day, leading to invasion of our mind and emotion by brooding thoughts which darken the atmosphere around us. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says, Be angry and sin not. Let not your sin, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. 
neither give place to the devil. So if something happened at this time and I allow it to remain in me and you know give it oxygen, keep giving it oxygen all through till night, I am in real trouble. And this is a serious thing. The Lord is saying that we need to take note of brothers and sisters. We need to know that the Lord is giving us a strategy of deliverance so that we can receive this strategy of deliverance and come to a place where we are not in any shape or form clutching at things so that those things we are clutching at will become a problem to us. Number four, the dangers associated with graduation of anger to rot must be recognized and averted because it expels the righteousness of Elohim from our heart. In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to rot, for the rot of man walketh not the righteousness of Elohim. Once anger graduates and gets on steroids to what is called rot, that is hot anger, bubbling, perpetual, continual, at that stage, there is danger. This state of rot is often manifested in hurtful spoken words. We may feel self-justified to express, but are guilty before Elohim and end up solving our witnesses before those who see such volcanic eruptions. And James 3 discusses in detail, and we're going to come to that. Four, if anger leads to malice, I mean, five, if anger leads to malice and an unforgiving spirit full of hurt and ought, the grace of Elohim is expelled. This danger must be recognized and averted. Hebrews 12 verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of Elohim, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Brothers and sisters, there's so much defilement in the household of Elohim across the world. Almost everywhere you see quarrels, offenses, churches are filled with polluted, with, you know, quarrels. Pastors are not able to deal with this because people don't know how to let go. People hold things, people cuddle at things, people feed things, give them oxygen life support and they grow from instead of dying they are growing and the flames are engulfing relationships across the world and the reason is that brothers and sisters are not schooled in kingdom culture that's why i want to say this to you are you a minister of the gospel in any way Either church ministry, non-church ministry, non-denomination ministry, it doesn't matter. The Lord wants us to know that every unit of the body of Yeshua should be a school of kingdom culture. Simple. Every unit should be a school of kingdom culture. If we focus on studying kingdom culture and knowing what the Lord allows or doesn't allow, we are going to come to a place of deliverance from the things that the enemy is trying to use to engulf us. So number six, to forgive quickly and promptly is not a favor done to the other person, but to ourselves. The person who is offended to forgive and let go is actually a favor I'm doing to myself. It is the only way to avoid self-imprisonment and giving Satan mastery over our lives. Because when you refuse to forgive, you put yourself in a prison, you've locked yourself and probably thrown the key into the river or into the ocean. Seven. So the ultimate, therefore, is to replace such an inner state of turmoil. Anger is turmoil. Offense is turmoil. Rot is turmoil. To replace such an inner state of turmoil with love, which in turn enables us to manifest true righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, which is the culture of the kingdom. In other words, if I refuse to Get, let offense have the master of me. Let anger have the master of me. Forgive and not just forgive. Don't leave yourself blank. Love. And how does that happen? 
You begin to intercede for that person, begin to be the intercessor, begin to look for ways to be a blessing to that person in different ways. Look for a way to solve something for that person. That way you are not blank. It's not just that you forgive. You replace hatred. You replace anger with love. Brothers and sisters, we also need to know that the eternal dangers for hurtful words. In that same Matthew chapter 5, 22, King Yeshua wants in part B, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Her brothers and sisters, listen, it doesn't make a distinction on who this is said to, whether spouses to spouses, whether parents to children, whether children to parents, children to their siblings, this is inclusive, or brothers and sisters in church, or neighbors, or workplaces. So, according to David Gossick of Enduring World Bible Commentary, and I recommend his Bible commentary, it's fairly good work he has done, David Gossick. He said to call someone Raka, express contempt for their intelligence. Calling someone a fool showed contempt for their character. Either of them broke the heart of the law against murder, even if he did not commit murder. Any of them. So commentators, he says, have translated the idea behind Raka as calling somebody a nitwit, blockhead, numbskull, bonehead, brainless idiot. I know some parents call their children these things out of anger, out of offense. Some people call their brethren these things. Raka is an utmost is an almost untranslatable word because it describes a tone of voice more than anything else. Its whole accent is the accent of contempt. It is the word of one who despises another one with an arrogant contempt. The Vigosi quoted Barclay here. Barclay is a commentator, an old commentator of the Bible. Then he quotes another commentator called France. He said, these are not uncommon or particular, or particular vulgar words, but they suggest an attitude of angry contempt. You idiot. You stupid fool. In all those kind of things, you are writing off somebody on the basis of something he or she did or said that you don't like. Then he quoted again, Bruce. And Bruce says, in these words of Jesus against anger and contempt, there is an aspect of exaggeration. They are the strong authors of one in whom all forms of inhumanity rouse feelings of passionate abhorrence. They are of the utmost value as a revelation of character. So, it's a revelation of the person who is authoring that. And the Lord is simply saying, we got to come to a place where we are careful whenever there's a stirring something and something has happened to make you angry one of the things we need to do according to james keep a mouth shut learn to put a lock on the mouth and also the heart make sure put it under subjection to the grace of the lord failure to receive grace to do this can open the door for entering to deeper levels of spiritual imprisonment that's what james 101 when you have time read james chapter 3 about the tongue he says it's a fire it's a word of fire it sets on course of things on fire terrible description of the power of the tongue so as we grow in the Lord, as we enter kingdom culture, we come to a place we must make sure that our tongue receives the sanctifying power of the blood, like Isaiah received in Isaiah chapter 6, that we say, our tongue, Lord, may I not use my tongue to utter any negative word. Even if it's something in the past, and we hear these truths, we ask the Lord to deal with us to the point that we are pure and purified by His Spirit. You see, it's grace of God. The Lord is not giving us this word to condemn us. He's simply telling us to come closer. Let Him make us like He is so that we can be like Him. We can live like children of His. We can live like people who have His DNA, loving, caring character. And make sure because it takes arrogance to sit in judgment over other people and believe that we can tell them anything we like 
even if we are leaders, bosses, whatever it is, where the Lord has placed us, we need to begin to behave towards others in a much more nuanced fashion according to kingdom culture. What Paul spoke about in the book of Galatians chapter 6, my brother, he said, brethren, if another be overtaking a fault, a brother, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in spirit of meekness. You can't use anger to restore somebody. You can't use offense to restore somebody. You can't use wrath to uh, restore somebody. You, he says, in a spirit of meekness. You want to bend over backward to help that person back. We want to bend over backward to enable that person. Brothers and sisters, this is kingdom culture, not religion. Religion permits you to do anything. In the kingdom culture, the king is our standard. And his standard becomes our life. Then going deeper, restoration of broken relationships. It says in verse 23, Therefore, if thou, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother had ought against you, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Here the king shows us how peace should be such a highly valued uh, uh, property in the kingdom through this precept. The onus of reconciliation lies with the more spiritual party whose senses are alive, not dulled by offense. So the onus is the one who has grace to approach the one with ought, even if that person is the one offending, because the idea is restoration of broken relationship. It's not about who is right or wrong. It's about restoration of the person who is offended to you. So the one who is more spiritual is the one who the Lord will expect, the Lord expects to do the outreach. And it can be anybody. It can be the younger, it can be the senior. It can be the male, it can be the female. It can be the husband, it can be the wife. At any given time, it's not an absolute term. You know, if you have a relationship with somebody, a brother, a sister, a friend, a spouse, there could be a time when somebody is more spiritual because he has more grace to deal with the issue than the other one. So this is not something that is absolutely tilted to anybody. It's a principle that if we recognize it and embrace it and walk the walk of that process, we're going to see broken relationships. You say, hey, restoring that relationship is of more value than the Lord, than that gift you want to offer the altar, whatever you want to do for the Lord. And so, brothers and sisters, receiving grace to be meek and to be able to restore people in the spirit of meekness is an imperative. When kingdom culture is embraced in this radical way, kingdom communities will become such a manifestation of the king and his kingdom to the grace, to the degree that people around see the love, see the unity, see the bond. And you know what? They will be open for the preaching of the gospel. What should we do? The key practice of kingdom culture requires a heart of obedience to the Lord who calls us to live the deeper life on the road less traveled. It's a life lived in the presence of an all-knowing and all-seeing Elohim who has given us a guide and has given us an enabler for our pilgrimage. Even Holy Spirit, he wants us to glorify him by the choices we make. Brothers and sisters, Yeshua is teaching us that something as gruesome and scandalous as murder, hugely murder. The newspapers will splash it. The radio TV will talk about it. It has a small root. That root offense, anger. If that anger is uprooted, there'll be no danger of progression to the actual act of killing anyone physically or killing one, you know, by subduing the things in that person. So, another thing that David Gozik, you know, gave in his enduring word commentary says, Jesus shows his authority and does not rely on the words of previous scribes or teachers. He will teach them the true understanding of the law of Moses. What a king is ours. Charles Spurgeon of the Metropolitan Tabernacle was quoted by Gozik. What a king is ours. Who stretches his scepter over the rim of our inward lusts. How sovereign he puts it. But I say unto you. But who but a divine being 
has authority to speak in this fashion. His word is law. So it ought to be. Seeing he touches vice at the foundation, the head, and forbids uncleanness in the heart. This is Charles Pogion talking about Yeshua saying, but I say unto you. Brothers and sisters, he also puts, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, which is the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees. You shall not murder. But true enough, he was saying that they were saying the Pharisees, anything short of murder can be allowed. He said, Yeshua, Jesus corrects this. It makes it clear that it's not only who commits the act of murder who are in danger of judgment, but those who have a murderous intent in the heart are also in danger of judgment. You know, the Lord wants to purge his house. Kingdom culture, this cause, if we are open and we prayerfully receive it, brothers and sisters, if we prayerfully receive what the Lord is saying, there will be such a purification and the Lord will help us. And that's why he says in 12.3, dealing with strife, shut down strife before it gets out of hand. He said in verse 25, agree with your adversary quickly while you are in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. For it lies so unto you, thou shalt by no means come out then till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. So here the king is also bringing another dimension of something. When there is strife, what should we do? Number one, strife can be avoided altogether by an attitude of not clutching at our opinions or our rights. Matthew 5.38, you've had it been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I saw unto you, resist ye not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee to the law and take away your coat, let him have the cloak also. And... Whosoever shall compel thee to go with him a mile, go with him twain. Men and brethren, it is serious. He said, Love thy enemy, love thy neighbor, and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the just and on the unjust, and his reign on the just and on the unjust. Look at that attitude. But avoid strife altogether. Let people have it. When you see the kind of quarrels people have, you say, why? 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 Why cannot people let go? Two, if dispute occurs, sin should avoid reliance on arm of the flesh. Arm of the flesh is money, power, influence. Rely on Elohim to deliver you. Hearing from Holy Spirit will guide you to know what to say or not to say. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to the councils, and they shall scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak, for it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So we should avoid our own ideas and opinions. Holy Spirit can say the right word through us at the right time, if we are sensitive to Him and are in tune with Him. Number three, in kingdom culture, we are not to love litigation or the worldly judicial system. Most of those who sit on the benches as magistrates and judges have training and affinities with certain cults, movements, which make them incapable of delivering justice to true believers who are loyal to the King of Kings. So this idea of believers loving litigation, running around, no, with unbelievers, settle quickly. Settle. Settle. Somebody wants, you know, extra money, and is in danger of taking it. If you have that money, give. Settle. He said, no, have that attitude. And then listen to this. Believers are not permitted to go to law against other believers. 
is part of kingdom culture. First, we're going to stop with that. First Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? You go to before the unjust, the one who is in the a lodge, in a cult. You take a brother, a sister to the law. He said, no. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Do you know that believers will judge the holy angels, especially those that fell with Satan? How much more? things that pertain to this life. If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed, not even the wisest and the greatest. Look for the least esteemed. Let them judge between brethren. Men and brethren, I speak to your shame. If this be so, that there is no wise, is it so that there is no wise person amongst you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Why are you going to court against another brother? Money, position, power, building, business, whatever. He said, but brother go to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourself to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Brothers and sisters, we're not permitted to sue one another. I'm not talking about people in your own local assembly or denomination. Anyone redeemed by the blood in the kingdom. If there's an issue, there are people who should be asked to look into it. Honestly, sincerely, impartially. And if the other party is not willing to make peace, let go. Money, let go. Whatever, let go. You know, with this attitude, you're going to see an explosion of grace in the household of faith. And we want to stop here. Brothers and sisters, by way of assignment, number one, please share five things you learned from this passage. You know, from Matthew 5, 21 to 26. Five things you learned. Two, what will you do with this lesson? We're going, to, we're going to pray. I want to encourage you, share this video. Share it extensively online. Also, if there are brethren within your sphere of influence, on your status, or whatever groups, begin conversations on these things and let it become something that we will allow Holy Spirit to power us in. Let's open our hearts to receive grace to put the past behind us, no matter how it was terrible. The Lord said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Let us receive grace to walk in a different way. And this is Kingdom Culture 101. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to receive grace from you in your word. Father, you are convicting us of sin or righteousness of judgment, let your word turn us around. Father, help us to understand the essence of this word today and let it be profitable unto us to your own praise and glory. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Let there be fruit, 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold in our lives. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen.